that. We have covered the material for exam one. We finished through page 93 last time. That's the cutoff of the material. That corresponds to homeworks one, two, and three. And then any lab material you've also seen, including next week's lab, which is hypothesis testing review with you. The material that I start covering today and next Tuesday and Thursday, that's new, will not explicitly be on that exam. But today we are going to interpret a confidence interval and that confidence level again. We will talk about a p-value from a z-test. It's just a different test about two proportions rather than just one. So many of the ideas that I keep emphasizing, so here's our p-value, here's alpha, how do we make a decision? They're going to be still tested on next Thursday night. It's just we're applying them to another scenario. So also next week, to entice you to come to lecture, to get that little bit of new, I also promise a little review. So I'm still picking my couple of lecture review questions to do with you in class. I'll have those up on C tools so that you can bring a copy with you next Tuesday and then Thursday. If you're planning to come to the review on Sunday, in the late afternoon, I do have those questions already up on C tools and you're asked to bring a copy of them. Certainly helpful if you even read them over. If not, try them out before coming Sunday. And we are set to have it captured and put up on iTunes U as we've been doing with these lectures. So if you can't attend, solutions will go up that night and the captured review hopefully by Monday morning. I also put up a copy of the cover page of the exam or in terms of the instructions that are there on the cover. Sometimes it's nice to take a look and read them through before you actually are sitting there in front of the exam. So you don't have to do that during the exam time. But it just reminds you about you know, cell phones off. It reminds you about points and they're in the problem so you know what the different problems have for points. Your calculator is allowed, etc. And that when appropriate you carry it out to four places after the decimal. If there is any number that goes on past the decimal point. That if you give me two answers, I'll grade the worst one. I mean, can't be true and false. You know, you don't get half a point for that. Um, and that we'll have the exams graded and back to you the following labs. So you take the exam next Thursday and the week after that, which is the week before of, right before break, you get your exams back. All right, I think those are my main announcements. Homework three is not submitted till tonight. I know I had a few in office hours earlier thinking it was Wednesday still, but it's Thursday. Solutions will be available to you right after it closes. Do you have a question or comment at all before we turn to a couple of clicker questions at the beginning for reviewing, actually? Questions or comments? So there's a pre-lab four that's open for your labs next week. It's another short little simulation. Need that review of what is alpha, beta, and power those terms that we defined at the end of last class, that's what you see in a visual simulation where you get to play around and make alpha bigger and see that beta is smaller and that the power would go up. There's also one mistake in the write-up of that applet that the author who created that still has there even though we've emailed to point that out. So that's one of your bonus questions to see if you can find that error that's in there. All right, questions or comments? What I have are just three short clicker questions that I'm going to have you try out. Let me give you a little overview in one slide first of what we have done most recently. Sort of that chapters 9, uh, what is it, 10 and 12 that we've just finished covering. So what was the situation, the background, the scenario? You had one population of interest and a response that you were measuring that happened to be categorical with either yes or no, success or failure. So there were two outcomes. You were counting one particular outcome and everything else was deemed a failure. So it was a categorical response with two outcomes and you wanted to learn about either estimate it, maybe with a confidence interval, or actually have a theory about this value called the population proportion, which is represented by what symbol again? P, population proportion P. So either you were trying to learn what that value is, so you wanted to estimate it, 
or you have a theory about whether you have a majority or some statement that you want to put to the test. So what did we do? We went to that population. We couldn't look at the entire population, so we took a random sample. And with that sample, which we do have in front of us and can observe, we calculated a statistic, a summary from that sample that is used to estimate that population proportion. And that summary was represented by P hat, our statistic, our sample proportion. So that value right there already is an estimate of that true proportion P. I also wanted to do more, come up with an interval estimate or test a theory. And for that, we needed to know a little bit more about this estimate. We needed to know its model for describing what kind of values you could get for that estimate if you were to take a sample over and over again. Because the value we get for our one sample is probably not equal to the true proportion P, but we certainly hope it's close to it. And we need to know a little bit about the behavior of that P hat, how it tended to vary. So we studied the model for P hat. We have the model for P hat when n is large enough to be able to use this model. And that was chapter 9. It's actually called the sampling distribution of P hat, or the model for P hat to describe what kind of values could you get for p hat if you took samples over and over? And what kind of model did we end up getting if n was large enough? We're seeing a lot of statistics end up having a bell curve model. We saw an approximately normal model. It was an approximation. The big capital N is for normal. Of course, to give me all the details of that normal distribution, I need to specify what is the mean and the standard deviation to have it completely <coughs> determined. And the mean and standard deviation were nice features. Sample proportions, values of p hat, tended to vary around what quantity on average? The true proportion p. You would expect p hat to be p, the true proportion, on average. It's unbiased. It's a good estimate that way. And what about the give or take to show you how far away from that true proportion you tend to be on average? That was a square root here for the standard deviation, and it was p 1 minus p over n. The n was on the bottom. That quantity we just wrote out is the standard deviation, which I can't compute unless I have the true proportion, or unless I hypothesize what that true proportion might be. Because remember when you write out your h naught, you always state p equals some number. So under h naught, you have supposedly the true proportion p, so you can actually compute that standard deviation. It's called the null standard deviation. So we use this model in order to do our confidence interval, in order to test theories. The confidence interval is based on p hat. The hypothesis test is also based on p hat, a standardized version of it. But we use our data to test theories about the parameter, or to estimate that parameter. Confidence interval looked like what? p hat went out plus or minus. We had this generic Z star, which takes on different values depending on how confident you want to be. And what sits next to it? The standard error. Now, what's the standard error? That expression right there is the standard deviation. The standard error is that same expression, but you put in the estimates, p hat. So the confidence interval uses the standard error, not the standard deviation. And it also uses this z star, which is our first clicker question regarding that z star value. So two things dictate that margin of error. How confident you want to be through the z star, and then also your standard error, which is primarily reflected by your sample size. So the sample size being larger makes that standard error smaller. All right. Now on one exam, I remember, we gave you the details of a survey so you could get p hat. And then we told you the margin of error was 4%, because that's what was reported in the write-up. And I had students still trying to actually calculate this thing, but I don't believe it had the actual sample size. It just said from a large sample size, here's the rate we got in our sample with a margin of error of 4%. And they were stuck, and they couldn't compute the interval. But if you have 4%, isn't that that whole plus or minus part? Right? You would just put in 4% right here for the whole thing. You don't have to work out the separate parts and calculate that 4% for me. All right, now when you make the interval, putting in the numbers usually isn't too bad. 
then you might be asked to write a sentence to interpret the interval, which should use the two numbers that you just came up with that make your interval. They should be in that sentence that tells me what those numbers mean in the context of the problem. And then you might be asked, well, if that interval was made with 99% confidence, what does that 99% confidence mean? Explain that level of confidence to me so I understand what it means, not in terms of probability, but in terms of the procedure. The process you use to make that interval is a good one, and describe that. All right, on the hypothesis testing side, we always had an H naught. What always goes in H naught? Two things. You always put what symbol? P or P hat? P. Always the population proportion, and it's always going to have the equal in H naught. And then there will be some value here. That value is called the null value, the hypothesized value. It'll be a number for any given problem you're actually doing some work with. And the alternative can have a certain direction. If your sample size is large enough, what kind of statistic do we calculate? This Z. We take our P hat and we look at how far away we are from P naught in standard deviation units. If H naught is true, I know the value of P. So I'm subtracting the correct mean. I'm dividing by the correct standard deviation under H naught. Notice that the confidence interval has a standard error there, not the true standard deviation, because you don't know that true standard deviation, and there is no under H naught in a confidence interval. But in a test of hypotheses, we are able to put down here the correct standard deviation. I point that out because the one you're going to see today where we do a confidence interval has a standard error, and then the Z statistic we can look at today has uh, updated standard error, one that's more appropriate under H naught, again, like we did here. All right, so there's your test statistic. It's the standardized version of your P hat. What model does your test statistic follow or have if H naught is really true? A normal distribution. Which normal distribution do you use to work with this quantity called a Z? It's a bell curve, but it's called the standard normal, normal 0, 1, because you're standardizing your quantity there. That's the model for your statistic. That's the model for your statistic under H naught. The picture I would draw if I'm going to sketch my p-value. All right. Now, we can't always calculate a Z statistic. The last example we did together on Tuesday was about the 10 patients and 9 improved. With only 10 patients, we weren't able to go to Z stuff at all. We had to go back to the model, not for P hat, not for P hat anymore, but the model for the count. The count of how many were successes in your sample. What model was that? Binomial. We had to use the binomial distribution to work out the P value, because that was the model for that test statistic under H naught. Good. All right, so with that little summary, three short questions don't really require any calculations give you a, you know, a couple minutes to read it over and try answering it. You can chat with your neighbor while the polling's going on. Question? The model for your statistic under H naught is a standard normal, normal zero, 01. You can either write the word standard normal, I know what that means, or you can write big N normal and put in zero and one for the mean and standard deviation. All right, first clicker question is on confidence intervals. You should know this based on your pre-lab and what you discussed this week. I think a homework question was similar to it. Just asking you to compare the intervals, if they were made at a 99% confidence versus only 95% confidence. Take the same data set, calculate those two intervals. How do the intervals compare in terms of their width? This one's not too bad. Think it through real quick. Put in your answers. <laughs> 
not too bad. If you answer E on the exam, you get minus 10 points, okay? All right, let's call it five, four, three, two, one. And what did you decide? Most of you said wider for 99%. That is correct. You have a couple ways of thinking it through to come up with that relationship. See, if I were doing this with my confirmation class, I would be giving like, you know, plus 10 points here. And all these others down here would be like minus 20, minus 30, and they would be laughing because, you know, they just, they laugh. And one with the most points, so gets starburst at the end of that time. Anyway, 99 versus 95. Think of a curve, a bell curve. And you started out with 95% in the middle, and now you need to have, with the same data, 99% in the middle. What happens? It's the same curve, so you're going to have to go out further to put more area under that curve and make it 99%. Don't have that in your head. You could also look at the multiplier, the Z star values. Where would you find those Z stars in the tables that you have provided with you? You get all the tables. We've only worked with two of them so far. Table A1 a lot, and you could find it from there, but we also have peaked at table A2 with the infinite row and look under the 95 or 99. Oh, it's a larger value, 2.5 instead of 1.96. All right. If you want to be more confident, with the same amount of data, your interval has to be wider so that that process would have attributed to it a better rate of including the true proportion in those intervals that are produced. All right, the next one has to do with p-value and whether you are statistically significant or not. So let's suppose the p-value for a test turned out to be 0.05. This result would be statistically significant at which level of significance? Don't get this rule backwards. I'm giving you the p-value. You have to pick the alpha. All right. So this is the p-value, 0.05. I need you to pick an alpha that would lead you to be able to say statistically significant. All right, I'm going to ask for your last choices. Ready? And what do we have? There are two correct answers. What's the better answer? They're both good. They both work. Either 0.05 or 0.10, 10%. Do you remember? You reject H0 if your p-value is what? Large or small? Small. Less than or equal to alpha. And then the results are statistically significant at that level alpha. So I've given you the p-value of 0.05. And you have to pick an alpha for which you could say you're statistically significant. So pick any alpha as large as your p-value or even larger. And then your p-value will be as small or smaller. Don't forget that at 0.05, you've just reached significance. So it goes with being able to say, yes, I can just reject H0. Your p-value is the smallest alpha for which you can reject H0. Your p-value is the smallest value for alpha for which you can reject H0. That value of alpha works or anything larger. 
All right, the last question might require a little bit more thinking. Don't have to calculate anything. You don't have enough to calculate the p-value. But you should be able to, by process of elimination, figure this one out. We're doing a hypothesis test about a proportion. It is a one-sided test to the left, to the smaller values. I get my data, large enough sample size is used, and the sample proportion is 0.22. That's p hat. Only one of these values in this list could even possibly be the p value. My couple hints. Think about what the z statistic would be looking like. And then think about what the p-value would look like, too. And I like to think of that in a picture form. My model for my statistic, z, is the standard normal if h naught is true. So I don't give you the sample size. You can't compute the actual value of z. But you can know what kind of z value it's going to be. Is it going to be positive or negative? <coughs> your p hat is 22%. You were trying to establish that you're less than 20. Uh-uh, you're not, right? There's no way you're less than 20%. You got 22% in your sample. What kind of z statistic will it turn out to be, a positive z or negative z? Tell me positive. So put it on the positive side over there somewhere. And then think about what the p-value will be. The p-value will be what? The probability of getting whatever you got or more extreme. The more extreme always goes in the direction of HA. All right, with that very great clue, you should change your answer. This area that is to the left, because that's your direction of extreme, must be only one of those values for a possibility. Better. It's D. Must be more than half. OK. When your data comes in on the wrong side, you were hoping for small values. Your data comes in and shows a big one. Oops, I guess I'm not going to reject H0 at all here. Not rejecting H0 means big P value. And when you're in the opposite side of what you were looking for, really big P value, more than half. The 20% that's in there for B is really your null value. The 22% is really your P hat. That's not your p-value, that's your sample proportion value. The 0.05 is probably the level alpha you were going to do your test at. But it has to be a number more than half. And that can happen. We had a couple students who did their projects in a spring term where they were comparing book prices for Amazon versus Borders, I think it was. And they had a theory of one being less expensive, and it came in the opposite with the sample of books that they had selected. So their p-value was huge. You'll actually see that data and work with it in one of your future modules because that's uh, one about means or average prices. All right, very good. Let us turn to our new material then. I'm highlighting your formula card. You have to know almost everything on the front page. Don't have to know that little bit on the bottom about means or formulas. 
on the second page, we're working our way through these five scenarios. We've done the first column, all about a population proportion. You do not have to remember the formula for finding your sample size. It's right there. You don't have to remember how you calculate a z-statistic. The formula is there. Both confidence intervals, the regular one and the conservative one. We're moving on to the second column, comparing two proportions. Page 95 of our lecture notes. We want to compare two groups. We want to compare men versus women in their opinions of some issue. We want to compare old versus young in their rate of success to some treatment. That requires having two samples instead of just one. And those two samples need to be independent random samples. Two samples are independent if the measurements in one are not related to the measurements in the other. When we did the handwriting activity the other day, you had two measurements on the same person. You each recorded a measurement twice. That's paired data compared to independent samples which are not directly related or matched up. There's a couple ways you can get independent samples. You can actually go take two separate samples from your two corresponding populations. You have a listing of all males and all females and you actually take random samples from those lists to form your two sets of observations. In some cases, there's really only one overall random sample taken. But you measure other variables that are not the response variable, but variables that might break up your set of responses into two independent sets, males versus females, for example. Then you can treat them as independent samples. Or in the experiment side, if you've got an experiment and you've got two different treatments, a standard and a new, and you take your 100 subjects and you randomly assign them to one of those two groups, now you have independent sets of data with those two separate treatments. Those are a couple examples. Now if our response is still going to be categorical like we've been handling so far, where there's a yes versus a no, or success or failure, then we're looking at two proportions instead of just one proportion. And with two proportions, I need to be able to denote them and distinguish them, so I've got a P sub 1 and a P sub 2. So I'll have some designation or legend, one is males, two is females, or something to tell me what those two populations represent. And I'm interested in comparing them. So I can think about my new parameter here as being the difference in these two proportions. In particular, seeing if that difference were equal to what number, do you think? What would that difference be equal to if really there was no difference in the two rates? Zero. So we'll be comparing that to see if zero is reasonable for this or not. Chapter 9 in your book is broken up. And one of the sections does talk about the two proportion scenario. They give you a little example of some research questions where that would arise. But the basic idea is we're now trying to learn about two proportions through their difference either an estimate of it or maybe test a theory about zero being a reasonable value or not. And of course, we'll take our two samples and calculate the p hat on both of them and look at the difference in those sample proportions. The data that we actually will look at today is a result of a time poll that was conducted on American adults. Asking them, have you ever driven a car when you probably had too much alcohol to drive safely? We're interested in comparing these rates for men versus women. P1 happens to be the proportion then for all men who would say yes. P2 represents that population rate for all women. I want to learn about the difference in the true rates. I'll take the data from my survey, split it up into the two sets of data for men versus women, and look at those two sample rates two p-hats. So will my difference in my sample rates be a good estimate of that true difference? What kind of values could I get for this difference in my sample rates? Would they tend to be right around the true difference? How much variability would there be around that? I'm again asking now for a second sampling distribution result. But we already know about p-hat. We just ran through that again at the beginning today. Sample proportion p hat has what kind of approximate model if n is large? 
bell curve. What do you think the difference in two sample proportions will have approximately for a model if the sample sizes are large? A normal. All right, so we need to study this sampling distribution. Here's where we need, and I'm just, it's highlighted here on page 96 briefly. I've got a little, I brought up the slide that we skipped earlier, and all I need to point out is one basic idea. If you're studying the difference, and I don't even need you to read through the whole section 8.8 .8 and go back over it, but if you're studying the difference between two quantities, and you have to work out the mean and the standard deviation to work out the right model for it, well, the mean of the difference is the difference in the means, so that's easy. Means are easily translated right through. Whatever the formula is you're working out, just do that same thing to those separate means. But the variance of the difference is the sum of the variances. And that's because you work out variances and then you take the standard deviation by the square root. And variances, you're always doing what? You're looking at each value from the, the mean and you're squaring it. And so if there is a difference in there, that negative one gets squared and becomes positive. The variance of the difference is the sum of the variances. So we're going to apply these rules and come up with the right normal model. Bottom of page 96 still highlights these particular rules that we'll be using. Do you remember the standard deviation for a single sample proportion p hat? Should be easy to remember because it's right there in your notes already. P1 minus P over N. All right, that's the standard deviation. So I'm going to use that form. If I have the standard deviation, how do I get to the variance? You square it. You get rid of the square root. What's under the square root is the variance. So I'm going to have the variance for one term, the variance for the other term, and add them together to derive them. So that's going to apply to our difference. Let's try it out. The box on the top of page 97. So if I have two sample proportions, not just one, from two independent random samples, and if all four of these quantities are at least 10, I've got to check that at least 10 rule for both sets of data. At least 10 yeses and at least 10 noes in the first group, at least 10 yeses and noes in the second group. As long as all of those are large enough, at least 10, then I can use this normal model approximation for saying what kind of values you'd get for your difference in sample proportions. I will be able to use the bell curve. What about that first thing that goes there, the mean? If I want the mean of the difference for p hat 1 minus p hat 2, I just take the difference in the means. And each p hat is going to be right around its true proportion p. So the difference in the means, the difference in the true proportions. Again, a nice unbiased estimator. The difference in your sample rates will on average be equal to the true difference in your population rates. But what about the standard deviation here? Well, I first need to do the variance and then take the square root at the end. And the variance for the first group would look like what? P1, 1 minus P1 over N1. There's the first variance. It's just like what we had for a standard deviation with a square root, but I'm putting the ones in there. Then write out the other variance for the second group. And what do you do to those two variances? The variance of the difference is the sum of the variances. And what should go there, though, is not the variance. I want the standard deviation. a large square root around it. That's what the standard deviation now looks like. So I'm going to use this model to work out my confidence interval and my hypothesis test. My confidence interval will try to use this standard deviation, but it won't get very far because I don't know the true P1 and the true P2. But I've got estimates of them. What is it going to be called if I put in a hat over each one of these proportions here? It's not the standard deviation anymore, it's the standard error, another standard error. And this particular form of a standard deviation will be simplified if H naught's true when we do that testing. All right, so the standard error, it's right there. You've got it in the middle of your page. And you've got another interpretation of it written out for you. It estimates roughly 
the average distance of those possible values now from their mean, which is the true difference. And we'll use this standard error to form our confidence interval. We'll also use a version of it to form our hypothesis test. So let's proceed to that idea. Let's do a confidence interval. Confidence interval for the difference between two population rates, page 99. We've already identified the key parts. Here's your best guess, the difference in your sample rates. Go out plus or minus a few standard errors. What will that few be again? We've got nice large sample sizes, so that few can be a Z star. What Z star will I use if I want to be 95% confident? 1.96 is the exact value. I still accept two. But if you're going to be 98% or 99% confident, you'll have to look up that multiplier. So you've got the nice summary. Every time we do a new confidence interval, I like the big box summary because it includes the formula, which is on your yellow card, but it also includes the bottom statement here. What does that interval require for it to be a valid interval? What are the conditions or assumptions? It requires that we have independent random samples. So the two samples need to be both random and those two samples need to be independent of each other. And then I need to check that at least 10 rule. And I need to do that for both sets of data. Large enough sample sizes, i.e. through this check of this at least 10 rule. That's the conditions that are needed. What are the conditions you need to do your confidence interval you might be asked about next Thursday? You need to, your sample is a random sample, and usually that's stated in some way. Unless we blatantly say, here's how the data was obtained, and we ask you, what about the conditions? You think they're met? And it would be like, no way, they're just a conveniently taken group of people or volunteers. But random sample, and then you need your sample size large enough. It's just like these checks here. It's just that you have it only for one set, and no N1 or N2, but just the N and the P. All right, so we have our confidence interval. Let's try it out. Here's that poll result. Asking men and women if you've ever driven when you probably should not have. 300 men, 300 women. Kind of interesting results. Of the 300 men, 189 or 63% said yes, they have. 108 had responded no, have not. There were three that weren't sure. How are you not sure? I don't know. But then you go to the women, the 300 women, and 87 said yes. Large number, 210 said no, and there were three of them that weren't sure. So my conclusion was those three men and three women are off on a date, they're at a bar, and they can't answer the question adequately. They don't know. I don't know. But we're going to take a look at the sample sizes and how many said yes. So either they said yes or they did not say yes for the two outcomes. And we're asked to compute a confidence interval to compare these two rates. I mean, the rates were 63% saying yes for men and 29% for women. It's a pretty big difference. Let's make a confidence interval to estimate what that difference might be, and then take a look at what values are in that range that's reasonable. So our sample sizes, 300 each, they look fairly large. In our sample, for sure, we had at least 10 saying yes, oops, and at least 10 saying no, or not yes, so we're fine there. Sample size is large enough. We do need to calculate, then, that standard error. Let's just point out that our p-hats were provided right for us, 63%, and women was a 29%. It's a 34% difference. Let's calculate the standard error for that difference in sample rates. So we can use it to make our confidence interval. So we need each of those two standard errors kind of put together. The 63% is used first. Sample size for the men was 300. And the 29% on the women's side. Also sample size of 300. So here's where the calculator would come out, and you need to show 
a little bit of work. Plugging in all the numbers and then giving me an answer is really enough work. But if I have an answer with no work behind it to show me where you got it and it's wrong, you can't get any credit for that. So plugging this in is a good first step, then showing what you get. When I see what, what you started with, if there was some number where you switched it around, I can find out where the error occurred and give you some partial credit perhaps. Point zero three eight is the standard error. This would be enough work, seeing the numbers plugged in. Because if you plugged in and you accidentally put 200 instead of 300, and so then your answer is off, I can say, oh, out of a three-point question, maybe that's minus a half or something, rather than a full three points off for that standard error that you can't get credit for because you have just a wrong answer. All right, so our confidence interval says take the difference in our sample rates and go plus or minus a few standard errors. We've got the standard error. What Z star should we use? You've already said it a few times. The exact value will be 1.96. The difference in the sample rates we highlighted was a 34% difference. And our full margin of error, working it out, the full margin of error is 0.075. So what does our interval correspond to? We go down to about 26.5% and all the way up to 41.5%. Now on an exam, I would likely have a final answer line, maybe even with the parentheses and two spots with a comma. So you would fill in your actual numbers that you're saying is your final interval. Showing me just the final interval with no work in the workspace at all would not earn any credit because there has to be work behind it. And I need to see a little bit about what you're using from the background given so I can see you're on the right track. All right, so we would estimate that difference in rates for men versus women to be anywhere from 26 to almost 41 percent. Let's fill in the numbers so we have our interpretation of the interval given first here. Here is a sentence to interpret the interval. We can start out with that phrase, with 95% confidence. That just lets the reader know what confidence level you used. I'm not asking you to interpret what the 95% confidence level means. If I were, then I can't use the word confidence to interpret confidence. I can say, though, for the interval, with 95% confidence, we estimate the difference in the proportion of men versus women who have driven when they shouldn't have to be somewhere between what two values? The range we have here, 0.265 and 0.415. And you could change that to be rates instead of proportions. The difference in the percentage of men versus women to be between 26.5 and 41.5%. Your interpretation of the interval should use those two numbers and should have something about the context of the problem. Not just saying we would estimate P1 minus P2 to be because if you really haven't identified P1 and P2 clearly somewhere, I don't know what those mean. Or the reader reading this statement won't know. So there's interpreting the confidence interval. If you were going to interpret the confidence level, how would you start out? If I were to repeat this procedure many times, good start. Then I know I would have not just this one interval that I just got, but I would have a lot of them. All the possible intervals. What can you say about all those intervals? As a collection, you know you'd expect 95% of those intervals to have what? Not the proportion. Not the true population proportion, because there are two of them. The true difference in the population proportions. The new parameter that we would expect to be in that interval. All right? 95% of the confidence intervals will contain the true difference in those rates, P1 minus P2. The true difference in the population proportion of men versus women who have driven when they shouldn't have. Good. All right. In particular, and here's a clicker question to answer the yes or no. We have our 95% confidence interval. There's a particular value that I would want to notice whether it's in the interval or not. We identified that value earlier as making the most sense to see whether the difference in the rates was that value. What value was that again? Zero. And zero is not in this interval. 
That should allow you to say something about this question then. Does there appear to be a significant difference between these population rates? Would you say yes or no? Does there appear to be a significant difference? Yes or no? Zero is not in the interval. Zero it does not seem to be reasonable at all for P1 minus P2, P men minus P women. I don't think zero could be that difference. So does there seem to be a significant difference? All right, let's see what your answers are. Ready? Last couple answers coming in. Yes, there's a difference. If there wasn't a difference, then what should be in that interval? Zero. And if zero were there, then it tells you P1 minus P2 could be zero. So there is possibility of no difference. But when your interval completely is not including zero, then you would estimate there is a difference. In particular, it's completely above zero, so it looks like the rate for men is higher than the rate for women. You have just informally already tested the theory we're going to be putting up next, the <coughs> hypothesis of H0. Is the P1 minus P2 equal to zero? And we would reject that because zero's not in that interval. If zero's not in the interval, then there seems to be a difference between those two rates. If zero's anywhere in the interval, then you could not statistically conclude a difference. Even though the sample rates might not be exactly the same, if zero's in the interval anywhere, then you wouldn't be able to say a significant difference. Good. We move on to one example of a test of hypothesis. I'm saving my pictures of the day for the end. Do you see, though, even though this is new material, we're still reviewing similar ideas, how to interpret things, Z star values. Same thing on the testing side. We're still doing chapters 10 and 12. We're just doing the last couple sections. This is 10 or 12, 4. Those are not going to be on your exam explicitly. I will not ask you to do a hypothesis test about P1 and P2, but I could have you do it for a single proportion P. I will. All right, same background. We have our parameter, difference in the true rates. We have our statistic with its corresponding standard error. The issue, though, in testing is under H0, you know something about those rates. In which case, then, we don't always have to use the actual standard error, but maybe we can get a better denominator to put in our Z statistic. So the standard error that we used here in making our confidence interval a few minutes ago is not exactly the same that we use in our Z statistic, as we'll see. We're going to drive it now. So let's first state the hypotheses. Oh, step one, you write out the hypotheses. What goes in H0 and HA? Do you put the parameter there or the statistic? The parameter goes there. Parameter is P for you next Thursday night. Here it's going to be P1 and the P2. You could write H0 as P1 minus P2 equals what? What's the common value we're checking to see if it's equal to or not? Zero. That's one way to write out the H0. And that's how all H naughts will look. You could, of course, equivalently write it how? That P1 equals P2. <coughs> Either one of those ways of writing out the H naught is fine. It just identifies the first way if you've got the parameter versus a null value, if you will. The equal always goes in H naught. The alternative can be one of three different directions of extreme. <coughs> 
maybe you're trying to say that the first rate is larger. So we would be having a difference that's greater than zero. Maybe you'd want to establish that the first rate is the smaller rate. Maybe smaller is better because this is side effects, less than zero. Or maybe you're trying to determine, is there any difference between men and women in terms of their rate for that particular characteristic? So a two-sided alternative. And in the one-sided test, if you write out the H naught with the full complement, with the equal there for sure, but the other direction too, that's okay. It's still correct. We'll need a test statistic. We've got nice large sample sizes trying to get to a Z statistic eventually, but look at H naught. In doing a test, we always assume H naught is true. So we either have some kind of null value to work with. If H naught is true, top of the next page, 104, a little ways down. If H naught is true, P1 and P2 are the same. There is no difference between them. So instead of having the women's rate and the men's rate separately, if really they came from the one big population where the rates are the same, put all the data together. There's a common population proportion. Don't have to distinguish between the two groups. So this common population proportion is what I want to use my data to estimate and use that in the standard error to have an improved standard error. So what would you do? If you had samples of 100 each, men and women, over here there were 50 that said yes, and over here there were 60. Now under H0, the rates should be the same. So instead of treating them as separate samples of 100, I'm going to make it one big sample of 200 and take the 50 and the 60 and put them together. That's what this formula we're going to write out is really doing. An overall estimate P hat, the common population proportion, is combining the two sets together. Total number of yeses on top over the total sample size on the bottom. Here's what your formula card has. And it really is the total number of yeses in the two samples together. over the total sample size. They write it this way because a lot of times you're given the summaries. 60% said yes, 50% said yes. And you've got to get those rates back to the counts. So the numerator is taking your sample size times the rate, so it brings it back to the count. Instead of saying 60, it was from 60% 0.6 times 100. So the n times the p hat on the top is just getting back to the counts, putting those total counts of yeses together and the total sample size on the bottom. So now what I'm going to do is take my general standard error, which can be approved upon, because under H0, there is nearly no separate thing as a p1 and a p2. So we put in that common p. Get rid of the numbers on the top there. Take away those numbers. And now I've got a p hat 1 minus p hat on the top. Let's pull that out. Just rewrite it a little differently. I have a p hat and a 1 minus p hat. Left over still a 1 over n1 and a 1 over the n2. There's your null standard error. That's what's going to be in the bottom of my test statistic, my z. It's an improved upon standard error that's better using all the data behind that estimate p hat because under H0 there is such a thing as a common p hat. So our z statistic then, our z test statistic is going to be using that null standard error. Let's take a look at how close our two sample proportions are or we could say how close that difference is to zero because there's your null value and we'll look at that difference in not exactly true standard deviation units, but a pretty good estimate of that standard deviation under H0. The null standard error goes below.
And that formula is on your yellow card, including the p-hat formula. But once you get it to a z, what do you think of when you think of a z? If h naught is true, what kind of model will this new test statistic have? Well, it's a z, so it's going to have a standard normal or normal 0, 1. So we'll get to use table A1 one more time today. We use that model to find the p-value. And the conditions are pretty much the same as those for confidence intervals. You still have to have each a random sample and independent. But note that the statement for how to check if you have a large enough samples uses the common p-hat. Just like your test of hypotheses next week, if you're checking the conditions, checks n times p naught, the null value, not p hat. So here we use the common p hat. Make sure under h naught we'd expect at least 10 yeses and nos in each sample. All right, let's try it out. Would you return a wallet with money if you found it on the street and would be able to identify the owner? I can remember my second son Got his first wallet, his birthday money in it, and going to Best Buy to pick out something and dropped it. And it was not found. And he was so sad. Those memories when they are attached to emotion, right? You remember them? My daughter's studying that concept now too in her science class. Okay. When you have kids, you go through learning again and again. I'm learning science, I'm learning all about Africa, I'm learning all about all kinds of stuff. All right, so here we have the results of a survey of college students. And out of the 93 women that were surveyed, 83 said they would return it. Out of the 75 men, 53. Let's assume we have representation of college student populations in general. Test the hypothesis that equal proportions of men and women would return it versus an alternative, thinking that women would be more likely. 5% level alpha is our identified alpha significance level. I'd like you to keen come up with the hypotheses. I'll give you the three choices and you just pick your answer with your clicker. You do, of course, in these kind of problems now, need to identify what is 1 versus 2, unless you keep the W and M notation if you wish. But you have to make sure I have a legend so I know your direction, if there is a direction in your HA, is the correct one. So here are your choices and the last clicker question of the day. Think. What hypotheses would we want to test here? Keyword. In the background of the problem, you should have an indication of what that theory is that you want to put to the test that often goes in your HA. And here that theory is that the rate for women is higher than that for men. That gives me a distinct HA alternative theory. I do see lots of different notation here, but remember equals always in H naught. I've had some put equal in both places. Can't be equal in both. Distinct. All right, we're calling it because I have a pretty good rate of success here. And that being C. It's a one-sided test. Someone's scoring very low on those means. One-sided test to the right. You set up your HA next Thursday night, and that direction is what I expect you to follow for the rest of the test. If you say to the right, and you get a negative test statistic out, and you calculate the area to the left instead to report your p-value. Maybe that is the real p-value because you set up HA wrong, but it's not consistent with your HA, so you'll lose points. You lose points more up front for getting the right start. Tell me what you're testing. But if you're consistent after that with your HA, I'm not going to take off points again. 
But if you're inconsistent with what you said you were going to do, you'll lose points again, even if that's the right answer on the answer key. So just be consistent. You usually end up gaining more points than losing them this way. All right, we have our direction. Let us do our test. Perform the Z test. Alpha is 5%. We need P hat. For women, it was what, 83 out of 93? And that's about an 89%, 0 0.8925. Carrying it out to about four places so I don't round too quickly before I get my final Z statistic. The rate for men was 53 out of 75. And that was about 70, 67. So there's about an 18, 19% difference there. In order to do the Z test under H naught, there's a common P. So I need an estimate of that common proportion called P hat, overall estimate. So out of the total of 93 women that were asked and 75 men, there's my total sample size on the bottom, what do I put on top? Now if you work it from the formula, you're kind of going to go circular. You already have the numbers to go directly on the top. How many said yes for the women? 83. How many said yes for the men? 53. Just take the total yeses. And that overall rate, would 92% even make sense? It should be some rate that averages out sort of these two numbers. So it better be in between them. How about about 80? 8095 because it's a little bit closer to the women than the men because there were more women in the sample. That makes sense. Any number outside of this initial range here would not even be reasonable. So now I can calculate my Z statistic. I need the difference in the sample rates on top. That 89 minus the 70. Then I need the appropriate null standard error on the bottom. We're going to use that 80, 95 as our common P hat. And yes, I'm carrying things out to four places because then my accuracy will be <coughs> maintained a little better. And I've got one over 93, one over 75. So it definitely requires a calculator. Work it out top and bottom separately. If I have 18, 58 on top, and then I would work out the bottom separately, because then if one part was wrong, it might be only a minus one out of the three points or something. And then if you take your Z and find the right p-value, no penalty from that point on if you do it correct. <coughs> Bottom's about 0 0.06. So what's about 18 over 6? My Z statistic is about 3, 3.05. I'm carrying that out to two places, because that's the closest I can get on my Z table. How different are these two sample rates? They're more than three standard errors apart. The first sample rate is three standard errors above the rate for the men. Do you think that's a pretty big difference? Do you think that's a significant difference? It probably is. We just have to confirm that by converting this test statistic value to this p-value. For the p-value, I need to draw a picture maybe. My picture would be what? Standard normal curve. You place on there what you observed for your test statistic, 3.05. You shade the probability of getting that particular value or something even more extreme. And no matter where you sit on the axes, you always shade based on your HA, because that's the direction of more extreme. We are out in the right tail, and I do want this small right tail probability. So I can look up 3.05 from my table. Table A1. Didn't you get a pretty unusual Z on your homework? Can you get any value of Z, like even 17.2? You can. You might still go back and double check because it seems kind of strange, but you could. And if it's off the chart, it might be so far off the chart that you're in the extreme might help you. Or you know it's basically almost zero or almost maybe one. 3.05 is in the chart. What happens if I look up 3.05? Is my p-value 9989? Take one minus. 
Now make sure you don't write things on the exam like this. Do not write this. 3.05 equals 0.9989 equals point, what, zero, zero, 0.001. Those are not equal. They lead to the next step, if you will. A Z of 3.09 needs an area to the left of 9989, which gives us our P value of this really small 0011. With that small of a p value, do we know our decision? My question is what? We want to know if we have significant results. Are the results significant at a 5% level? Our p value is what? Pretty small. Alpha is 0.05, standard level of significance. When I ask you, are the results significant at a 5% level, I'm asking you, is your p-value less than or equal to your alpha? And our answer to that is yes. What would be your decision? That will be circling usually on exam, so we don't have you write it out, so we can read your, you can circle. Reject H naught or fail to reject H naught. We get to reject. You reject H naught. If your p-value is low, HO must go. Ha ha. You could write out a conclusion, I hope, too. The conclusion should say, we have sufficient evidence. Say the rate of women who we return that lost money is higher than the rate for men. That's your conclusion in words. Here's my pictures of the day, tomorrow at noon. At Huron High School, synchronized swim. My daughter's in it. I'll be going to watch. And then Friday night and Saturday, going on today right now, too. Great Lakes Conference. My son is swimming right now. I'll be looking to see if he made it to finals shortly. Hope you have a good weekend.